If you ask me what time it is, I will tell you this morning that it's time to run. That is the title of the message today, Time to Run. Father Time did some wonderful things and he still is doing. Father Time made an allocation to each one of us. Father Time doesn't look at us and say, well, you are a pastor's kid, let me give you preference. Or you're the eldest boy, or you're a good choir leader or singer, and let me give you some favoritism. Father Time does not favor anybody. He gives all of us the same. All of us have 12 months in a year. We have 52 weeks. That makes 365 days. That makes 8,760 hours. 525,000 minutes. 31,536,000 seconds in a year. And we are told to make every second count. What did you do with your time? We are supposed to have time for ourselves. We are supposed to have time for others. We are supposed to have time for God. Some want more me time and they take all the time they even take the time that's allocated for God understand time is to be used wisely it comes to go and if you don't use it it still goes it brings hope it brings life it brings opportunities, it brings success, it brings failure, it brings loss, it brings challenges, it makes wise, and it also keeps foolish. What you do with your time and how you use it is your choice and it is your business. You can waste it, you can sleep through it, you can ignore it. Or you can appreciate it and work with it. In time, in time you can become the most lazy, ignorant, stupid, poverty-stricken, vagabond. What a name. Vagabond. Time gives you that chance. Or you can become smart. You can become industrious. You can become work-loving. You can become prosperous, you can become generous, you can become a God-loving individual. Time does not take sides. It has no favorites. Father Time never sleeps, never tires, never ignores. Every second without fail, he has things to offer. You can choose from the basket. There's goodness, there's joy, there's love, there's peace. At the same time, there's also anger and bitterness and jealousy. What you choose will make your day and determine your mood. Don't say next time. Time is precious. Time is priceless. And yet time is free. Use it to be healthy, use it to be wealthy, use it to be wise. Understand, one of these days, Father Time will say to you, your time 
is up. This morning we're talking about time to run. And we're going to start with the scripture that's recorded in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, we also, seeing we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I think this is one of the most important scriptures that we should memorize and constantly remember. And I'll read it again. Therefore, we also, seeing we surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so, do, so easily besets us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The scripture says that we are being watched. Sometimes we feel no one sees us, but he has an indication that we are watched all the time by a multitude of people. And their job is to cheer us on, encourage us on, to prompt us to keep on going on. And these witnesses are not only those that are around, but more so they are above. The unseen hosts that's made up of angels and saints that moved on, family members that moved on that are watching us, and they are saying, you can make it. Don't give up. Not now. I know you can make it. Just hang in there. Just stick in there. Just carry on. Just carry on. And we are told to carry on. No time to sit. No time to sleep. No time to laze around. It's later than you think. It is later than you think. Time is going, so we need to be going. Time is going, and we need also to be going. You're in the race. Oftentimes we sit back when we call to run. We look at ourselves and we say, hey, I'm not into that anymore. I can't run. That's fine. But this particular race is not a physical run. It's more than that. Never mind your age. You're in the race. God is not saying or asking you permission or trying to get you into the race. He says you're already in the race. You're already there. You're part of that group that is running. When there is a marathon and we see these marathons and races all of the time down our streets and the countrywide one that's from Maritzburg to Durban and Durban to Maritzburg, the, the great marathon. We see those people that are in the race and we see sometimes the struggles. We see them fall out. We see many persevere and even crawl to the finishing end. God is saying, you're in the race. And he's also saying... I wouldn't put you in the race 
if I knew that you won't make it. Understand this. God is also telling us that he won't get us in the race if we don't have the capacity not only to start but to finish. We have the ability to get into the race and we have the ability to run the race. Never mind the diabetes, never mind the high blood pressure, never mind the heart complaint, never mind all the other problems that we have mentally and physically. Never mind you have no experience. Never mind you never ran before. Never mind you don't know what a marathon is all about. Never mind you in the race. There's some things that you need to do, important things that you need to do now that you're in the race. And when you watch the guys that are running in the race, here's a funny thing. Especially when you watch on television the marathon from Marisburg to Durban. Marisburg is far colder, you know. And they start congregating from about 3, 4 in the morning, 5 in the morning. And, and uh, that is the time they all start getting together to uh, getting in line. Uh, they have their allocations where they are set to run from and, and the positions and they all get in line. And it can be biting cold, bitterly cold. You'll never see anybody with a overcoat or a jersey. Why? Why? The race requires them to run light. And you'll see them with the shorts and maybe just a t-shirt. You see them shivering, they're waiting. They know that the moment they get in the race, they're going to heat up. The warmth is going to come. They can't be burdened with clothes. With those things that will hold them down. And God is saying you're in the race and the first thing you need to look at is get rid of the weight. Get rid of that weight. It says lay aside. That's what the scripture says. Lay aside every weight. Firstly it talks about weight and then it talks about sin. Lay aside every weight. What is weight? Well, low self-esteem is not a sin, it's a weight. And we start right there getting that right. Oftentimes we go into a race with already a mind made up, with a mindset. I'll never make it. I don't think I'm capable. I don't think I have the stamina. I don't think my leg will carry me through. I think I'm a little bit old. I think I don't think it's for me. I don't. And and we go with a negative attitude, and we go with a low self-esteem, and guess what? We're bound to fail because you told yourself already you're a flop. You told yourself already you're not capable. And therefore, the Apostle Paul encourages us to use one line, and I hope that line will be the line that will carry us all, to, all the way through. And the line is this. I can do it. I can do all things. I don't care how big it is. I don't care how terrible it is. I don't care how... how, 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 how un, 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 uh, whatever, gigantic it is. I can make it, I can do it, I can shift it, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. So we need to leave behind the low self-esteem. We need to leave behind the discouragement. I'll tell you what, if ever there are wounded people in church, and there's plenty of them, and one of the reasons they sit wounded is because they've been discouraged. They've been discouraged in church by what was said. 
they've been discouraged in church by what was done. They've been discouraged in church by the by the looks they had. They've been discouraged in church by being sidelined. They've been discouraged and nothing else kills you like a discouragement. And they sit discouraged. They want to go, but they feel discouraged. They want to do it, but they, they feel this discouragement so heavy. And the discouragement becomes like a boulder that keeps them down, that stops them from moving forward. Discouragement. God is saying today, get rid of it. I don't care what it is. No matter who said what, get rid of it. If you're uncomfortable in some place, go to another place where you're a little bit more comfortable. But go ahead, keep running. Go ahead, keep working. Go ahead, do that which you call to do. You're not allowed to sit down and sit back. And so discouragement is a weight that needs to be kept aside. Unforgiveness. And resulting from discouragement, we have sometimes an unforgiving spirit. You can tell me what you want to do, but I'll never forgive them for what they did. After all I did for them. Imagine that. Imagine what they said. Imagine what they did. Imagine how they treated me. I'll never ever forgive them. And so... You think you're smart as we take that approach. What we are actually doing is bringing ourselves under bondage as we chain and lock ourselves by not forgiving. The Bible is very clear, Jesus is very clear in saying, if you don't forgive, neither will my Father in heaven forgive you. Whatever it is, you forgive them. I'm not saying that you need to come back to the ways that you used to operate with them and work with them. No. Release them from your spirit. Forgive them. Father, forgive them. Jesus said it so publicly after they spat at him, after they kicked him, after they booted him, after they speared him, after they did all of those things. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I think that is another big weight that we need to get rid of, the weight of unforgiveness. Learn to push that weight aside and move on. Sometimes we are governed by grudges. We hold grudges. We hold grudges. And we are able to say, I don't care. Never mind I'm a Christian. Never mind what God says. Never mind what the Bible says. I'm not going to release. Go ahead, church. Don't hold grudges. Don't hold heads. Heads may be many. You may be bleeding as a result of heads. Disappointments could be many. But please, please release them. You may feel insecure. That's a weight. Release that weight. Fear is a weight. Fear of the unknown. Fear of the challenge. Fear of not knowing whether you're going to pull through. That is also a weight. You need to push it aside. You need to push doubt aside. All of these weights, take it and push it aside because it's not required for the race that is before you. You need to run light. Don't wallow, wallow in self-pity. Sometimes we get to a point where we, we get attention or seek attention by the misfortune we've had. And so we play the same record over and over again. And we want people to hear how we've been hurt and how we've been going through some tough time. And so we want to wallow in self-pity. This brings a, 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 a sense of feeling good, you know, in, in saying those things that you've been going through. And you want people to feel pity for you. But you need to move on. 
You can't carry these things with you. You got to leave it behind. You got all, all, all the weight to weigh you down. The job of the weight is to weigh you down. And if you don't get rid of the weight, you're going to be weighed down. So firstly, you got to get rid of the weight. And then you got, the Bible talks about the sin that easily beset us. The sin that easily ensnares us. The sin that easily entices us. The sin that easily imprisons us. There is the general sin that affects everybody. And then there is the tailor-made sin that affects you personally. The enemy watches and the enemy wants you down. And the enemy knows he can't get you through maybe money and girls and, and, and pride. He will use anger. Maybe that is a big thing that's sitting on you and use anger as a, as, as a tool. So when you look at sin, we find that pride plays big. And as long as you think there's no one like you, that you're the dude in town, that you're the deal, you know, and you want to push yourself forward and all of the time, the Bible says that pride comes before a fall. Be careful. Be careful of that pride. Maybe it's lust. And lust can be such a demonic factor that can pull you down. Maybe it's gambling. Maybe it's obsession with self. Some people have obsession with self. You know, there's no one like me, you know. Yay, I'm it. Check me out. Hey, I got style, you know. Some people have obsession with self. Some people are kleptomanics. In other words, they have an irresistible tendency to steal. You trust me on this one. You find this sometimes among rich people. Sometimes it could be among rich white people, white females especially. You see, what happens is, is this. They're looking for some kind of excitement. Not that they need to steal. But, but stealing does something. You know, going and doing something and getting away gives you a sense of pleasure. And to show you, well, hey, you know what? You're a macho man. Hey, <laughs> I got away, you know. You know, the, the thing, I got away. No one saw me. I got away. And that gives you a, a, a new kind of high. And, and, and so we have people, like I say, even many rich people, that will go and look and slip a, a book maybe in their bag, and they got away, and they go home excited, hey, I got away. No one saw me. And they go for bigger things and better things. And, and eventually they get caught. Sometimes after many years, sometimes they never get caught. But what happens is there is that irresistible urge. I'm not sure today what is your weight, what is your sin. The devil knows your weak area. He knows that weak area and he'll tap at it till he gets you down. You see, you see, you need to get rid of the weight because there is a race to run. You need to get rid of the sin because there is a race to run. And if you allow these things to bog you down, you can't really run the race. Because you're consumed by these things, these things. And we need to get rid of these things that occupy us that keep us busy. We need to run with patience. The Bible says, run with patience. Okay? Run means hurry. Patience means wait, chill out, take it easy. They seem to be like a contradiction. But God is saying both. He's, he's saying, run is an action. 
patience is an attitude. So we pace ourselves inside while we run on the outside. There need to be rhythm. There need to be calmness of the spirit. There need to be a balance. There need to be a balance. And so when we start the race, we need to be excited. You see, if you don't have patience, then it's, you're, going to, you're going to have a problem in that you'll find these irritating things coming in and you find that you can't think clear, you can't pray, you get easily angry, you complain about life and you complain about every other single thing. Are you going on that trip where you get very edgy and very irritated too quickly? You don't have a spirit of patience. You get just angry with everybody. You get angry with everything that they do. You think that they're never right and they never will be right. And, and, and you're forever trying to go and correct people and carry on like that. I want you to know that God is wanting us to run. And while he's wanting us to run, he's wanting us to have patience. He's wanting us to understand that we need to be calm and we need to be collective. We need to, be, to, to pull ourselves together. We need to see the big picture. We need to know there's a race to run. We need to pace ourselves. There need to be balance. Well, we need all of that. And we need to keep running. Firstly, we run to God. And many run away from God. And many are on the run. And forever we find that the community are looking for people that are on the run. But we are in the run. And we are running to God. We run to God for forgiveness. We run to God for cleansing. We run to God for deliverance. We run to God for healing. We say, Lord, here am I. Heal me. Heal my past thoughts. Heal my mind. Heal my soul. Heal my spirit. Heal me, Lord. We run to God for reviving. We run to God for refreshing. We run to God for rekindling. We run to God for refilling. We run to God for repowering. We run to God. We run to God with prayer. We run to God with praise. We run to God with worship. After having run to God, then we run with God. Understand this, you can't run alone. You run to God, and then you run, go run with God. What did the Bible say in the last portion of that scripture? For the author and finisher of our faith is Jesus. So Jesus is in the starting point, and Jesus is in the end point. So when we come to Jesus, he says, now you run, and he's running with us, and we're pacing ourselves, and we're running. A marathon runner won't go on a fast run. He wants to get to that point, but he won't suddenly get on a fast run. He paces himself. He says, well, I need to just jog along. I need to go at a certain pace. I need to keep it, keep the momentum going. I don't want to tire myself too quickly. I don't want to pull, uh, uh, you know, uh, overdo it in the beginning. I need to save the energy for the last run, for the last part of the race. So we need to understand that we're not alone, that he, he is in the start, that Jesus is in the end, and that Jesus is our guide, our shield, our buckler all the way through. He is the honey on the rock for us. He is our daily bread, and he is the living waters. The Bible says that we need to run, and we understand there's something about this run. In Ephesians 6.15, it says that our feet 
are shod with the gospel of Christ. Ephesians 6, 15. Our feet are shod with the gospel of Christ. What is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. So in other words, God is empowering our feet. And as we run, we find that we are able to guide, glide through because we have powered feet. It's like having powered roller skaters. It becomes easy. It becomes easy. It becomes easy as we run along because we are guided by the power of God and the Spirit of God. So we need to keep going. I am running. Nothing going to keep me back. Acts 20, 24 says that I might finish my race with joy. We started the race. Look around you and you'll find that many have started the race. They've started the race energized. They started the race in praise and worship. They started the race in the Bible studies and in the, in the Sunday schools and, and all of the other activities in church. And suddenly when you look around, they see them sitting down and they see them abandoning, abandoning the race. We are not called to only start the race but we call to finish the race, that I might finish the race with joy. And I think that one of the things that we all need to say ourselves and encourage ourselves with every time is say this one, I'm a finisher. I am a finisher. True, I started. True, I'm running. But what is also true I'm going to finish the race. I'm not going to sit down now. I'm going to run. I'm going to run. I'm going to finish the race. And I see, and I hear, the voices are telling me, the witnesses are telling me, you can make it. 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 And I think what the church should really become is church leaders. And I think if we can apply that title to ourselves, what a change it will make. Cheer leaders. I'm a cheerleader. What is a purpose of a cheerleader? What does a cheerleader do? Cheer people on. See people all the time, sad, dejected, lonely, isolated, hurt. People all the time, more so in church than anywhere else. And how nice to look beyond ourselves. And you see that sister or the brother, just stab them. I understand. It's okay. You're going to make it. Just the word of encouragement. You're going to make it. It's going to be all right. Just hold the hand and say, I'm going to pray with you and I'm going to pray for you. Cheer people on. Don't be people that will push other people down and keep them down. Cheer them on. Prompt them on. Tell them if they can make it because we have a God that is able to give become a cheerleader become a cheerleader I'm a cheerleader and do the job of a cheerleader cheer people on I need to run on we need to run with purpose and I'll close with this you need to run with purpose you need to run to fulfill a dream. You need to run to reach a goal. You need to run to understand your destiny. What is life all about? What is your destiny? In the final things, 
what is God having for you and wanting you to be? What is your destiny? And then of course you're running to get a crown, a crown of righteousness. And how nice on that day when you complete the race, you're called and you're given a certificate, you're given a crown, you're given an award. You made it that you made it. Hey, you can look back the corridors of time. You can look at the skeptics. You can look at those people that tried to pull you down. You can look at those people that insulted you. You can look at those people that said a whole lot of funny things that you'll never make it. But here you are. You're finally running through. You're sweating, but you're running through. You're tired, but you're running through. You, 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 you know, you, 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 f you're feeling excited because you're running through, because you're making it, because you've reached the end. It's you, it's you. Your name is called. It's you. You made it. And you get the crown running. Can't stop. He's calling me now. I'm not going to run, stop. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to stop. I'm not ready to stop. I'm running away from my past. In my running, I'm running away from my past. I'm running away from my faults. I'm running away from my mistakes. I'm running away from my shame. I'm running away from my embarrassments. I'm running away. I'm leaving behind the reminder that I never was good enough. I'm leaving behind that reminder. I'm carrying it no more, no more, no more. I'm carrying it no more, no more, no more. I'm carrying it no more. The past is junk. The past is past. The past is history. I'm leaving it behind. And guess what? I'm running. To my future. I'm running with patience. I'm running with excitement. I'm running with joy. I'm running with hope. I'm running. I'm running. I'm running. You can't hold me back because I'm running. You can't keep me down because I'm running. You can't hold me because I'm running. I have a made up mind to keep running. Would you run with me? Would you run with me? Would you run this race that God has called us? Would you run? Let's just stand to our feet this morning. Praise his name. Praise his name. Praise his name. Would you like to say praise his name? Entire church, would you like to say praise his name? praise his name. We praise your name, Father. We praise your name, Father. Everybody saying, we praise your name, Father. We praise your name, Father. We praise your name, Father. We just praise your name. We praise your name for allowing us to be in the race. For allowing us to be in the race. Strengthen our hands, our feet, our mind, that we would keep on going on for Jesus. Father, we thank you for this time of refreshing. May we be encouraged in our hearts, O oh God, to keep running, because that is what you want us to do. Praise your name. May we be known as runners, not shakers, not those that have fallen down, those that are sitting down. May we be known as runners. Praise your name. It's time to run. Praise your name. Father, even as we conclude today, pray for the threefold blessings of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to remain with us always, even till Jesus comes. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you, church. God bless you.